Welcome, everyone. Dr. Bierman, it's a pleasure to meet you, so to speak. Meet you at the <laughs> um, We have a very special guest today. And um, as some of you probably already know, I experienced a couple of strange things throughout my life, and I wanted answers. So um, I have some dreams that come through. They're not one or two, but they're 30 or 40 throughout my life. And most of them are not about me. And they're usually about disaster. It's really strange to me. It tends to make one think they're crazy. Until I found out that probably thousands or tens of thousands or even millions have the same thing. So I was starting to research it. And the more I found out about it, the more um, widespread that I discovered that things like this were. And some other special things that go on in a lot of people's lives. And I thought it was important to do a build to share knowledge, share stories, find out what the new knowledge is, and kind of spread the word to see if we can figure this out together or help people figure out figure it out by volunteering or um, just getting more knowledge and sharing it. It's in networking is the key because I saw in one world conference on this topic that a very important message was said by one of the scientists, and that is, not one single person is going to get to the bottom of any of this. It's going to take all of us or several of us to put our heads together, get different perspectives, and kind of come up with our own knowledge and our own specialties, put them all in one basket and see what we can come up as a collective. Because some of the things that we are finding is more and more about that we are a collective something or other. So I, I just found this all fascinating. And I haven't talked to a single person yet has not experienced something along the lines of any of the topics covered by this sim. And I think Dr. Bierman has a fascinating perspective and an important um, angle that he's going to bring up today. So I hope you enjoy what he has to say. And without further ado, I will step out off the stage and give it to Dick. Dick, it's all yours. Thank you for coming today. Okay, okay. Yeah. Now, thank you. Thank you very much. And basically, this, uh, this presentation, this talk will be about communication, about how to share the knowledge. And uh, as the title already suggests, we don't share everything to uh, the uh, general public. And actually, uh, let me go to the next one. Uh, this is the way it's often perceived uh, in the skeptics proponents discussion that people are trying to hide the truth. And uh, I claim that's not correct. This is a, it's basically a bad picture because in experimental sciences we are not dealing with the truth at all. What we are dealing with is data. Experimental data and these data will guide us to develop increasingly better models. Better in terms of uh, describing the observed phenomena and also better in terms of predicting outcomes of the future experiments. So it's not on the truth. This lecture it's on uh, how do we communicate the data and what's known. Okay. Now, somebody already did, or did I do that myself? Uh, put on the next slide. Uh, so it's all about the public representation of experimental data. And uh, it's mandatory, it's really mandatory, I think, for a scientist not to select data when he is going, he or she is going to tell or present uh, the results of experiments. I, I will come back to that. Later, this whole selection of data, which is done uh, uh, not only by scientists, but also by journalists, etc., etc., uh, gives an incomplete and sometimes even incorrect picture. And in this talk, then, I will argue that the public government presentation of parapsychology, for instance, in courses like this one, is not uh, reflecting what's actually known. I've seen there has been a, a, a presentation by Dean Radin and by Julia Mossbridge. Both are strong believers, strong proponents, and uh, I'm pretty sure they have not paid much attention to the, ad, to the aspects that I will pay attention to. My argument is that these secret features, uh, like poor replicability, Declines, analyzer effects, psi experimenter effect, retro 
psychokinesis, etc., etc. There are many of those that are generally not really presented, are essential uh, for understanding the phenomena and for progress. And by withholding these to the public, experimental parapsychologists have frustrated progress. Now, this message, of course, is not directed, not really directed at you as a public, but uh, to uh, the general uh, experimental parapsychologists. And uh, I'm afraid that this, uh, this has an implication, since this talk is basically uh, uh, directed at my colleagues, it might be a little bit boring for you. I'm not going to present you sensational data. And I apologize for that. Now, we have uh, claims and assumptions going on in this field. And um, we have to see uh, which of these claims and or assumption and assumptions uh, are basically sustained by the data. Now, one of the first uh, claim is that psi phenomena by, by people like the, uh, the, uh, most of the experimental parapsychologists, they uh, claim that psi phenomena are part of the, obje of the objective real world. So that the, the real world as physicists describe them. But what is objective reality? There is a kind of a, a definition in science, so scientific objective reality, that it are phenomena that observers, many observers, different observers, can independently agree upon. So we, we agree upon, we, you have observed this in this and that situation, I, and I repeat the experiment and I can uh, and I can agree that what you found is the same. And in that sense, uh, it, it's interesting to see that, for instance, Buddhism is the religion where there can be objective reality to the phenomena that have been claimed. Nobody, of course, can display its own inner workings, but uh, the Buddha teacher will explain how to experience yourself these inner workings. So these inner workings become thereby, according to this defini uh, uh, definition, an objective reality. In the experimental manipulative sciences, so that sciences where you first you control a lot and you manipulate variables to see what it has, what effect there are on the outcome measures, the the absolute requirement for objective reality is that phenomena that, that, that these phenomena can replicate, that others can do it again, given the description of the experiment that you did already. And then if they repeat it, they should get some replication. But that is an, uh, another issue. What is, uh, what is uh, uh, replicability? Well, I can, I can read this uh, for you. This is a precise definition. If in earlier experiments there has been an effect, let's call it E, generally it, has, it is a number, an effect size. So uh, uh, let's say if you, if you count the number of events of precognitive dreams, then, in, uh, then an, an other, there's an experiment that is going to count that uh, by questionnaire and an other, uh, um, and it gets some effect and finds a number, uh, then uh, an, a second experiment should find a more or less the same. And that more or less is really important when there is all, because there's always a normal variation. And uh, in more technical terms, it, it's basically what you can do is you can calculate a probability distributions for future experimental outcomes, depending on uh, the number of subjects that you use in, in a multi-subject study. The same thing with the, then a slightly different calculation. You can also calculate the number of subjects that to, required to get a significant, statistically significant results, uh, given if you know this E and the V. Now, the definition then becomes an effect is replicated if a new experimental result is not in statistical conflict with the distribution of output predicted by the earlier measurement. So replicability doesn't mean that you, each time you do the experiment that you will find the same outcome. No, it is basically a distribution uh, that you compare it with. And you, you look basically 
whether there is a statistical conflict. And we'll get back, for instance, I give you an example. If one experimenter finds that people who believe in psi do perform better on some psi tasks, so their E is larger than the E of people that do not believe in psi. That's called the sheep goat effect. If you, if you do the same experiment with the same, uh, uh, with the uh, subjects that you have selected in the same way as the earlier experiments, you should uh, get more or less the same results. It doesn't have to be significant, the result, the second time. But uh, it is a problem when in the second experiment, now suddenly the goat, the, the people that don't believe do better. And that's a conflict. And then you have a failed replication. Okay. Now the question uh, is, uh, now we, we know what the replicability is. Is it true or not that we have replication in parapsychology? And uh, this is a, uh, that actually the, the um, discussion on this hasn't been finished yet. Uh, because it started basically with saying uh, that uh, meta-analytic data are a proof, uh, at least the proponents uh, claim that, 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 that meta-analytic data, and most, most importantly, uh, a, a set of data that you probably have uh, uh, heard about, the Gansal meta-analysis, those uh, data would be a proof that we have replicability, can do it again. Now, this is not quite true. If you have a careful look at the meta-analysis, at least at the Gansel meta-analysis, which is the, the most famous one, then, then it, it turns out that we can show that the results of the meta-analysis under the assumption, and that's very important, that parapsychologists are as good and, as, uh, and use the similar research methods as normal psychologists, then uh, it turns out that these meta-analytic results for, uh, oh, for over 50% can be explained by methodological weaknesses, so questionable research break. And then the whole issue of replicability is again uh, dubious. Now, I won't discuss all the methodological weaknesses that we have found in these uh, experiments. Uh, I, I'll take one example, and this has to do with the exclusion in experiments of sub subjects. And I'm talking out about post hoc exclusion. So exclusion. So you get a subject entering the lab, you do you run a consult session, uh, it, uh, and then at the end uh, it's either a hit or a miss. And um, What what happens is that in in general in ge uh, what happens is that in general exclusion criteria should be uh, formulated before you start an experiment, not after it. However, we uh, know that people are not that precise. That's one of the methodological weaknesses, and they might uh, say. Uh, that suppose uh, that the subject has been uh, silent most of the time in the Gansfeld and had only a few utterances during the 30 minute session and it said that this uh, subject should be excluded. Now, at the end of the session, uh, then we know there is not much communication between the subject, uh, the subjects, the sender and the receiver, and that means that, uh, sorry, there is no much um, thinking aloud protocol by the receiver. So that it's, we don't know what the receiver is experiencing. And it should be, this receiver should be excluded. But now the problem is basically that in a Gansfeld experiment, uh, the uh, hits are generally celebrated. That is, there is a hit at the end and everybody's happy. Because that's that's the way it is. These uh, people, um, many people, try, uh, do see this kind of phenomena as a su support of the world view. So they want support for the world view, and a hit is a support for the world view. 
So they are, they are very happy. Uh, and now our uh, our position, our uh, assumption is that these uh, uh, in that situation where you have a hit and everybody is celebrating, nobody thinks anymore about this criterion, and you can actually justify uh, the, uh, that you keep the, the subject in the pool because he uh, not because he has hit, but because you didn't say how much how much utterances are required. A a uh, a criterion with few utterances doesn't mean a lot. It's three uh, uh, few or ten few. So people with a hit are not excluded, and people with a miss are excluded. So this is one of the of the problems we have in uh, in, in the Gonzalez uh, meta analytic database. But there are other databases, and each of those have their own problem. In the database that probably. Julia is talking about <clears throat> uh, uh, the problem is is in multiple analysis that's on the database of pre-sentiment ex uh, experiments where you measure a physiological signal pre preceding a stimulus and uh, in some way or another it looks like the physiological anticipatory signal is already predicting what the stimulus will be and uh, th these uh, experiments have been labeled presentiment experiments. They uh, they seem to be very significant and consistent and even possibly replicable. Uh, but there is a, a, a methodological weakness in the sense that the uh, pre response is never well defined. Uh, it, it, for instance, in skin conductance uh, physiology, you can measure from five seconds before the start of the stimulus or from seven seconds only three seconds and all these choices should uh, should be accounted for in the statistics and, and they aren't and so we have many many problems with this exclusion with this um, experimental data okay so we are ready now for the first secret although it's not a secret anymore because i've explicitly told you already. So the, the meta-analytic data are presented as evidence for uh, 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 replicability. What is not told is that the claim to, rep uh, claim to replicability doesn't exist as I will show you later in a more concrete example of money-making remote, remote viewing. Uh, we cannot exclude <coughs> that non-replicability is a fundamental property of science. And here is an important uh, observation which uh, might uh, drive uh, new theoretical uh, definitions. Uh, in the standard ad interpretation of experimental sciences, uh, that if if replicability is not there, it's as non replicability is a fundamental property of psi. That means that psi is no object reality. Yeah. In the traditional interpretation of science and objective reality. So science has to be altered, not our not our small model, but the whole the whole fabric of science as is at stake if this is true. If the phenomena are basically fundamentally not rapid in in experimental parasitology. Actually uh, the, the fathers <coughs> of uh, parapsychology have already noted this, and they called this uh, this behavior elusiveness. So all the fathers, fathers such as, for instance, Jeff William James, which is a famous father, have noted that the phenomena tend to change abruptly or disappear the moment you think you get some control over them. They label this as elusive. Uh, a, a parapsychological researcher, uh, Brian Miller, once compared the ID to catch psi, to measure psi, so he, he called it catch psi, phenomena in the lab, and he compared that with trying to put a universal solvent in a bottle. And he suggests that illusiveness is the fundamental property 
of psi. So non-replicability or illusion. Now, you will never hear this at presentations. Uh, uh, generally, people try to argue that it's big that these phenomena are, well, we have a lot of uh, variables involved and a lot of factors and we cannot control them all. That's why these, these outcomes are erratic and elusive. As an example we, of this illusiveness, we recently, very recently, had a student project where, in, uh, where individual differences between subjects were measured in relation to their scoring. Uh, so things like, uh, so they handed out a questionnaire and they asked, are you a sheep or a goat, etc. And are you open, have you, do you have an open personality or not? And, and so there are very many findings in uh, experimental parapsychology, so-called findings, uh, uh, which were embedded in this questionnaire. And it turns out that all the relations that we found, uh, interestingly, we found the same variables that uh, we, we had 50 questions and there were about six or seven that gave a significant result. All the results were opposite, reversed from what was known from earlier experiments. Now this is a really totally crazy. So we have gone through the software many times to find out what, what was happening, but this is what I mean by elusiveness at its worst. You have far, the, the most parapsychologists agree that sheep do better than goat in a size study, but uh, not this time. Actually, the reverse. Now we go to another uh, claim, uh, which is often uttered by experimental uh, parapsychologists, but that claim is incorrect. And the claim uh, concerns with quality, the quality of experiments. And uh, I did first, I, of course, I did first the, the, the issue of the replicability uh, uh, for you, because that's the most important one, the core issue in experimental science. But the following secrets that I uh, will uh, uh, pa let pass by are uh, less important, but still they have to be mentioned. One of the things is that in most meta-analysis on experimental pathology, like the meta-analysis on psychokinesis and on presentiment, the authors claim that the more significant the results are, the better the quality of the experiment. So the idea is if you have a perfect quality, you get a very significant result. That is the, the uh, reported uh, quality. Uh, and and the, the, so, yeah, it's a counter argument against uh, skeptics that say, well, it's all sloppy research. But if you look at the quality, if the quality is better, the effects are, are larger. So it's, should, it isn't, uh, it isn't, uh, sloppy research. That's the, ar that's the argument. But, uh, and that's in the next one. There is an enormous uh, problem in measuring quality of research. And, uh, the authors uh, of this, this quality um, analysis, they uh, use the publications uh, to assess the quality of research. Uh, and it is obvious that, of course, these publications to, uh, to assess the quality of research uh, are not reflecting true quality because written reports do not report everything. It's impossible. And in case of psi research, the quality is generally assessed by checking if the experimenter did exclude normal explanations for anomalous results. So you will have in the publication, you will have a, a paragraph, uh, alternative explanations. It's called. And then they, they uh, give all the quality uh, uh, measures that they, or all the quality uh, uh, interventions that they did. For instance, they produce uh, uh, extensive randomness checks on the, uh, on the random number generator. And that kind of stuff is uh, written in that section on, on uh, alternative explanations. However, <coughs> Um, uh, what, what is the case in scientific reports, and especially in this kind of report, is if you have no 
effect, then there is no no reason at all to report alternative explanations. Why would you do uh, a, a randomness check if if you know the the data are just chance data? There's no reason for it. And that those <coughs> so they you won't find in uh, in articles which have no effect, which report no effect. You won't you won't find quality measures, and uh, the quality is assessed as very low. Now, if you look at this uh, graph, then you see in black uh, points you see the the way it is reported by uh, the uh, parapsychologist, and if you correct, for instance, the the uh, the points, the black points uh, with the low effect size. They didn't report quality measures, but they were of high quality. And uh, therefore, if you correct, you will get the red dot curve. And there is the se selection uh, that uh, if, uh, or here is the inference, could be the inference. Let, let's put it this way, because I, there is no one who has ever measured this red dot. Because that's a lot of work. You have to go to the original experimenter and ask what he did. And why, and so on, and so on. Then you get a good quality assessment. So the red, the red graph doesn't exist, and it, it's an, uh, it's, it could be like that, and it means that it could be that if you uh, uh, increase the quality uh, fair, further, then you get on the left side here, and you get uh, a null effect. So actually, it it would. Uh, support the notion of skeptics that the better quality the experiment, the, the smaller the effect, and so on. That's a bad message, but uh, <clears throat> the only thing is that uh, they uh, it's not hidden under the carpet. Actually, this is hidden under the carpet, because I did report this uh, effect, or this pot potential incorrectness, did report it to many people in the field, and they or uh, choose to deny or not listen to it. And then you are hiding things under the carpet. But not maybe not the truth in this case, because we don't know whether these uh, red dots are the truth. Okay, this was basically a sidetrack. Let's get back to the uh, the claims and assumptions. Uh, this is uh, a claim, an assumption that has been uh, proposed, uh, but it's more assumption. Mo many people uh, assumed it. Uh, side effects uh, can be modeled by some signal transfer. That's the nicest, uh, uh, nicest model, uh, the radio, mental radio model that people have. And the, the spiritually inclined parapsychologists, these signals are labeled non-local, which is a, a, which shouldn't be done because non-local is a a, a, um, a concept from uh, quantum physics, and it's confusing. <clears throat> but uh, so in uh, tele in telepathy, uh, uh, there is a supposition that, that there is a that there is a, uh, a sender of some psi information and a receiver. They are generally also called like that in in, in uh, experiments. Uh, my, but uh, what I will argue is that model is really totally crazy, and it's not uh, because... Um, uh, be, well, that's why I have added in this... Uh, on this slide, a picture of a neuron-to-neuron -neuron transmission of signals. So things that happen in your brain, right? And uh, ex uh, if we assume that psi in some way happens in the brain, then uh, then I think the model is crazy because the model ha needs some extra additions. What is the signal? And then, how is it possible? The signal then is uh, something that is received and then filtered, so that it that it presents it to yourself as per a personal relevant. 
Now, what, and now we have to think about what is being filtered. Well, uh, if we look at uh, par paranormal uh, phenomena, then they uh, don't, uh, they transcend time and space, as that is called. So you can uh, have dreams from the future, you can have dreams from the past, uh, of uh, nearby, far away, etc. That's a lot of information. It also, it's incredible, I mean, it's all the information there is in the world, and that has to be filtered then, until it makes sense to the receiver. I think this is not a proper, this, that cannot be a proper model. Of course you can say, well, maybe it, uh, the brains do not play any role. There, and if their brains do not play a role, then there are no limitations to whatever model you, you propose. But uh, I think uh, the brains pr play a role, and uh, that seems to be obvious. But this signal model implies actually a little bit more. It implies also that you can use psi. Well, because a uh, signal that you can replicate can be used. Okay, so if you assume replicability and you assume signal, then you need to assume or you you, you predict that the, that uh, uh, the signal can be used in applications of psi in a robust way because the signal is more or less rapid. <clears throat> now I uh, go to uh, the precognitive remote viewing experiments. I won't explain that. But uh, that's a, a basically a, a clairvoyance experiment uh, where indirectly information about uh, the, a future were, is obtained. And uh, for instance, a roulette is, uh, the, the outcome of a roulette is obtained. And the claimed effect sizes uh, by uh, selected subjects there is uh, an effect size of 65%. That means that uh, uh, you uh, have 15% more chance, more than chance, uh, the probability that you can win on a roulette by playing black and red. And the variation of this effect size can be expressed as the duration of the effect, uh, that effect uh, disappears before it reappears. Let's say, uh, a, a gifted subjects are not always a, a, as gifted as on each day, the same giftedness. So that varies, and you can say, okay, let's uh, let's assume that the giftedness goes away for a month or for two months, and then returns. And on the average, then getting sixty-five percent case. Now, what we have done is we have simulated that in a computer simulation, uh, but it's very easy actually to simulate a roulette and and the predictions of sixty-five percent. And and we have combined that with an extremely simple roulette betting scheme. Uh, then it turns out that if you simulate this situation, which is claimed, the claimed effect size is uh, claimed and the replicability is claimed, then the probability to earn a huge mo uh, amount of money, and I'm talking about hundred thousands of dollars in a year, is larger than eighty percent. And only a five percent, that's really a very uh, small percentage, your initial sum got lost. So you start with a sum. And the um, the betting scheme actually is as follows. You use only 50% of the cash you have. And you will stop when, when the cash runs below $10. <clears throat> However, Psy researchers are always asking for outside financial support. That shouldn't be necessary, given this data and assuming we have a signal that can be used in 65% of the cases, we can be rich. We don't need money at all. This, so this is uh, the third, this directly uh, uh, results in the third secret. And that is that generally effects evaporate once the effects are being used, for instance, to make money. And uh, some of the spiritually inclined proponents responded when we uh, uh, did this simulation and we said, well, you know, why are you so uh, poor people and, and complaining about that everybody is looking down on you? You can make money. 
And then the uh, spiritually inclined proponents respond to that, Psy can only be used for the good. So making money is apparently not good, which can be discussed about. Um, in spite of reports on black magic now, if you have uh, something that isn't good, that's black magic. So uh, that's, a, a, I, I think, a, a, a pity, a pitiful escape uh, route that doesn't work. But even without the explicit goal to use Psy, uh, you know, to make money or whatever, uh, uh, the results tend to decline and possibly incline again that we don't know that there are indications that uh, there are strong indications uh, in, 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 for instance, distant healing research that the results uh, decline in a few years to zero. But uh, sometimes it seems that uh, they incline after that period again. And this is called the decline effect. And, uh, and uh, there is one psychological explanation, <clears throat> uh, and that's uh, that uh, if you repeat experiments, it becomes more boring. And if uh, boring, uh, it's not good for science. Something like that. Okay. So that was secret three. Now we, have, we can go on in this way, but I don't know. I'm, I'm now going a number of the, those secrets together. Uh, and those uh, are then, let me see, it takes some time before the slide comes up. <coughs> it, it may be, uh, by the way, uh, it, uh, I'm presenting uh, a very dark picture of what my colleagues are doing, but it may be that the cyber research is presenting evidence uh, and, and it, then it may occur that uh, some of the secrets that I mentioned are mentioned in passing. Uh, uh, so it's it's more that the experimental effect, I will discuss the experimental effect, that's the most obvious one. So the secrets, uh, or uh, basically they present the, the data and the secrets have been forgotten as is the case in this uh, slide on with the Second secret, uh, the analyzer effect. Uh, but mostly the secrets are not uh, stressed or presented because they are they are in some conflict with this this signal model and and uh, and doesn't fit the whole uh, idea of mental radio. For instance, the experimental effects are. Very often mentioned, I think uh, probably uh, Julia has mentioned it, and maybe Dean. Dean is considered Dean Radin is considered to be a experimenter that always gets good results, and that is an experimenter effect. If the experimenter gets good results and then other experiments get bad results, then you have an experimenter effect. Why experimenter effects are mentioned at times is because they are psychological. There's a psychological theory that some researchers are better in handling subjects and better in bringing the subjects in the proper mood for showing side effects. So that you have friendly experimenters and nasty experimenters, etc. And we have two experimenters here uh, on this slide, on the uh, on the bottom of the slide. On the left side, uh, there is a, uh, a researcher called uh, Richard we Weisman, and on the right side, it's uh, the researcher Marilyn Schlitz from ions, uh, pre previously with ions. Um, okay, what they say is basically, this is a so-called Rosenthal effect. Rosenthal was a psychological researcher who was the first to note that some students that that uh, ran animal experiments got much better results than other students. And he, he had this idea that some students are being very rough with the, with the laboratory rats and therefore the, the rats are confused or whatever and others are friendly and, and therefore those experiments bring about the best behavior. Now there is a famous Slitch Weisman study and it's not on rats, it's just with uh, subjects and what they did is uh, they did, they ran the study in parallel to begin with and half of the subjects were assigned to uh, Weisman and handled by Weisman, and the other half was assigned to Merlin and handled 
by Merlin, and that was a random di split. So there was no systematic difference between these subjects. Now, Slitch uh, got uh, strong anomalous correlations, strong psi results in her data, while Weisman got nothing. I'm paraphrasing, paraphrasing the results here for clarity. So it's a slightly more complex, but it's interesting to read anyway. Now we can understand this, and uh, it's generally, uh, everybody who's met Marilyn Schlitz knows how, how good she is in, in uh, handling subjects, and is, is very friendly. And Wiseman is more cynical, uh, not unfriendly, by the way, but certainly more cynical. So, this is what we, uh, what is, might be mentioned, uh, and I think it might be, have been mentioned to you by, uh, probably by Julia Mosvich. <coughs> of course, uh, Dean doesn't want to talk about experimenter effects on, uh, because he is an, he is, uh, he is one of those experimenters that uh, only get good results. Anyway, uh, there is another issue at the experimenter effect uh, discussion, and that's that it is not a Rosendahl effect, but a Psi effect. Because the experimenter, there is no, no way to, we have not a Psi screen. We, we cannot isolate Psi, and an experimenter is dealing in an experiment with a subject, but why, why couldn't he uh, uh, be responsible for also psi input. So now we have a problem. The experiment, the experimenter is is basically another participant. We get a confusion between participation and 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 and, and, and really running the experiment. And the same uh, Brian Miller again claims that all results are experimenter effects. And the reason he says is that experimenters are highly motivated. They have to support a worldview, and subjects, especially unselected subjects, so students that have to do an obligatory uh, exper ex small experiment, they are not motivated at all. So Miller says, uh, well, there are no, uh, there are hardly participant effects. Only when the participant is a selected participant, a gifted one, that has a good track record. This is, in short, the analyzer effect. As uh, uh, our uh, moderator, uh, I don't know her um, second life, Maggie Larrymore, uh, has done an analyzer effect experiment herself. So she knows what I'm talking about. But interestingly, nobody else in the whole parapsychological community is talking about that anymore. And it is a, it's a big secret, really a big secret. Because if you do an experiment, okay, so you run your experiment. Now all the data are recorded. In, in a traditional perspective, this experiment is finished. But the data are in, the subjects are go, the participants are have returned to their home, and the experimenter uh, has the data that he has to analyze. And uh, it turns out that the uh, it's little known, uh, but there are a few uh, experiments where experimental data were split after the experiment and given to two in the independent persons to analyze. So that's slightly different from the slitch weisman manipulation, where the experimenters uh, were, uh, got split subjects. Now analyzers got split data, and, and this splitting of the data for two independent analyzers is known in is known in the, has been known in literature as the Edinburgh split. But um, uh, that is uh, forgotten. I think uh, the last time I read about an Edinburgh split is uh, 20 years ago. Now, uh, one complication is that uh, experimenters generally tend to analyze their own data. Uh, and that's, uh, 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 parapsychology is a poor, uh, poor, uh, uh, field, so we have no money for, uh, totally independent analyzers, so the experimenter is going to analyze the data. So we cannot disentangle anymore, uh, in that case, uh, what is the contribution of the analyzer and what is the contribution of the experiment. It, it's an interesting, an interesting, um, issue. 
because uh, once this uh, Slitch uh, Weisman study was done, where they had uh, they had uh, their own subjects, <coughs> so subject pool, but uh, and and they analyzed those subjects. So uh, I suggested that they would uh, split the data again before analysis, and then uh, uh, analyze half of the data that were run by the other experimenters. So Merlin Schlitz would analyze half of the data by uh, produced or under the supervision of Richard Weisman and vice versa. And that was blamed, uh, was just refused. They said, no, we are not going to do that. That's, that doesn't make sense. And, and that is basically the issue. Analyzer effects, they don't make sense. Uh, they suggest However, that uh, the past can be changed. And that is a, a, a thing that people, even parapsychologists, don't want to talk about. So, uh, the, the analyzer effects are very important. And then the third secret that, uh, uh, that I had on this uh, slide, per, uh, uh, experimenter effects, analyzer effects, and retro PK. Now, what is retro PK? At some point, PK experiments, that is, people trying to influence the fall of dice or electronic equivalents, uh, were meta-analyzed. And uh, this was uh, done by Dean Rain and Roger Nelson. And they concluded uh, that uh, PK is an objective reality. They uh, analyzed about uh, 800, in the order of 800 uh, experiments. However, uh, a large consortium uh, from uh, Princeton and German researchers uh, could could not replicate this uh, phenomena, so the uh, objective reality claim became uh, weakened. Now this it becomes all really very strange if one looks at the data of PK on pre-recorded targets. What is that? You have a, uh, for instance, you have uh, a, uh, a machine that throws dice, and you put that on video. So there's nobody present, you let the machine run, and you put it on video. And then later, you present the video to a participant asking to get to produce more sixes, okay, on the dice. And uh, it, it turns out that this type of experiments, which is totally crazy, you, you, uh, is uh, producing as good or better results as real-time PK, where you try to influence the fall of dice when you are there present. It's better, actually, or at least the data are, are better, the results are better if you do it on video, if you try to influence something that it has happened a long time ago. So again, this is so scary that past can be changed that, uh, and, and, and doesn't fit the mental radio model. So radio PK research is virtually dead. It's inc incredibly uh, unbelievable, but this is how the field works. They don't, it, it doesn't, it doesn't stick, right? And my, my presentation here is that we should remember all these secrets because they seem to hint at something. And there, that's where we are going now. Let's look where they hint at. What we want to do is making sense of the secret. And if we are able to make sense of secret, of these secrets, then maybe we can develop a new model, a more uh, accurate model. But uh, it could be that we cannot uh, develop a new model, but that, that uh, one of the consequences might be that science has to change its methods. Which is a basic, that's really an interesting conclu conclusion. It's much more far reaching than saying, well, you have to accept that we have a sixth sense. Oh, people will say, okay, sixth sense and, and go on. And especially people in academia at universities, they are, they are, they are not interested in the sixth sense. And, uh, they, they will be interested if it turns out that science has some uh, some secrets, so to speak, so, uh, drawbacks. Now, suppose basically psi is reader causal. Now, this requires a, a, uh, a revolution in your thinking because humans are causal creatures. 
they we will we learn learning is very important and we learn in order to plan the future so we have a totally causal picture of the of reality think the cause and effect have that order in time first cause then effect suppose however that this is not really true that uh, also the future can then have an impact the actual future can have an impact on the present that's that's the reader causality and reader causality uh is an interesting uh, uh topic because uh, during the last um uh, 20 years uh we have seen an explosion a revolution in physics publications so you know the hardcore sciences on the reader causality it's uh, ex it's um, exponentially growing the number of publications so that's uh, that gives a good feeling it's not totally crazy to think about reader causality now for instance uh, telepathy and clairvoyance is caused by reader causal effects of the future feedback so if we do an experiment and uh, and we ask uh, so somebody to uh, to describe what's in another person's mind then what basically is happening is that he's describing or he or she is describing what the future feedback will be so it it all remains in one brain so the brain of the sender is totally irrelevant uh, the sender is there probably for just you know the mental radio model so that people can believe uh now interestingly this is uh, this is an is a prob problematic issue uh, people are always thinking in in terms of uh, mental radio for telepathy but if you look at presentiment precognition and reader pk they are fundamentally and by definition reader causal that is the effect is pre uh, pre is is happening before uh the the manipulation in presentiment you have a manipulate you have you look you measure uh, physiology and uh and at a later stage you you present a, a stimulus and uh, it, it, apparently the physiology is depending uh yeah yeah okay Ma maggie uh, explains my uh, poor english Thank you. Uh, so the, the, these two, the, the, the whole, all the phenomena, at least the phenomena that we can see in the lab, seem to be, uh, you can frame them in a retrocausal uh, framework. And uh, there are phenomena that, uh, uh, like poltergeist and, and other uh, large-scale phenomena, may be framed within a, a uh, reversal of the second law of thermodynamics so that also the second law of thermodynamics is a time have, has a causal picture but uh, if the time runs backwards so to speak popularly then uh, things uh, then order order uh, will uh, increase rather than decrease which is the normal second law of thermodynamics anyway that's that's a side reader causality or time travel allows for paradoxes to occur now that's very important for instance i give you a, a uh a, a, an, an example of a, such a uh, paradox if you dream of a a, a a a fire in your house that will be will take place next day and you can even see in your dream that it's a, a candle that uh was disturbed that uh, caused the fire then of course you go uh, find all the uh, candles in the house and burn them first or remove them at, at least now this means that you have taken away the source of your dream because there will be no fire anymore and that's a paradox and it's a paradox which is actually uh, uh, equivalent to the well-known uh, time travel paradox of the grandfather paradox where you take away the source of yourself your your grandfather so you you kill your grandfather but you, by killing your grandfather you take away your own birth so you cannot kill your grandfather so there is a paradox now <clears throat> there have been uh, uh, lots of 
theoretical discussion on the paradox issue. Mostly in the topic of time travel, which is a, a normal topic in physics. And people like, uh, uh, the, the, well, the major people actually uh, in the field of physics, theoretical physics, have uh, talked about. My point at this, uh, that's all theory, and, and, and it's not yet experiment, although maybe we are doing in parapsychology experiments with paradoxes, although we don't realize it. And the way to avoid a paradox is making the results unstable, elusive, declining. Wow. That makes sense. So maybe this is what's happening, that paranormal phenomena cannot, are difficult to replicate or are not replicable because if you have a paranormal phenomenon that really can be used, then you can also use it to create a paradox directly. And uh, we have done this at the University of Groningen with really strange results. Anyway, we are approaching a, a kind of a uh, uh, unification or uh, conclusion. My conclusion now is that most of the secrets that I produced may be a product of the fundamental time symmetry in nature. This is an issue that is highly discussed now in physics by, for instance, a, uh, a physicist called Akharanov, who got a medal from Obama, a kind of an American Nobel uh, medal. He is the inventor of weak measurements, and uh, uh, that's something you can look up, but in any way, in relation to the weak uh, measurements, he claims that a weak measurement has, has uh, causal effects from the past, but also from the future. And his model is getting more and more attention. <clears throat> the second conclusion that I would like to draw is that hiding secrets, uh, some of these uh, incredible findings are also hidden and we cannot progress if we do that. And maybe that is not very important for you as a lay public, but it is certainly uh, important at a channel conferences and etc where also colleagues are listening and a further conclusion is that maybe the definition if these phenomena uh, do exist in some way or another although they are not replicable then uh, we might uh, 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 go to uh, sign scientific um, methodology uh, people and and ask them to uh, to uh, investigate if the science itself can be changed in the sense that the definition of objective reality can be adapted. Scientific modeling, and that is so far always causal, uh, temporarily causal, except the Acheronov example that I gave, must be adjusted. We, we must assume if, if, if radio causation is, plays a role, we must introduce that in our models. It is uh, to be expected that these conclusions uh, are difficult to swallow by the academic community because they signify a scientific revolution with far, far more, as I said before, far more impact than just adding a sixth sense to the biology of humans. Uh, in some sense, what I've been talking about is a politi political issue. Information is always filtered and selected, as, as we all have seen uh, in the uh, elections in, in the United States. Uh, and we cannot avoid to select, e even when presenting scientific findings. One has to choose what to present and what to leave out. The tendency to present those findings that seem to fit in a simple sensory model, rather than to present also data that appear confusing, inconsistent, and for many researchers are difficult to accept, is another selection. It's a decision. Which of these selection strategies is optimal in terms of raising interest in global scientific, in the global scientific community for a parapsychology is difficult to assess. However, as I hope to have shown, presenting those data that don't seem to fit at least suggests a unification of all psi phenomena to the underlying facility.
Video causality, by the way, is an other uh, that I already talked about. I hope, and that's the end, I hope uh, all this uh, talk was not too boring, and I thank you for your attention. Thank you. So there are questions, I suppose. Oh, a Dutch-speaking Martin. That was fascinating. Thank you very much. Okay. Well, I, I, I hope that uh, uh, some of the colleagues that I, uh, I ought to di direct it to uh, will also be fascinated and not uh, making me out for something like a <laughs> mad Dutch scientist. I have a question, but let me toggle my voice on and off because people are telling me I'm breaking up. I'll be oh, right no, back. It's okay. It's okay. It's okay now. Oh, you're fine seconds. now. You're oh, fine now. It, it's coming in clear, yeah. Okay. I'll read my question again. I posted it earlier. I found the retrocausal thing fascinating. Um, if, if, if a person dreams a disaster before it happens, they don't have any control over that. That's not something they consciously cause. Um, no. It, but if the dreamer then wants to prevent that disaster by means of I don't know how else to do it other than mind control, if you want to call it that. But that would be a conscious attempt. So I wonder if that really works. Yes, and that also, been, yes, I understand the question. Uh, it's, I gave an example where you really have an easy way to uh, for an intervention so that the, the dream turns out not to be true. For a disaster, yeah. there, are, there are several options. For instance, um, if it is a airplane crash and you see the uh, you see on the on on, a, on in your dream you see the the number of the of the flight then uh, you could call uh, you could call uh, air airport uh, although i know that they won't take uh, they won't take a, a single call as a, a reason to stop the flight but if uh, several people would call then it could be uh, stopped and then you create the paradox okay uh, if it's a disaster like earthquake then of course you cannot do anything about it and uh, if you try to do that uh, as you suggested by your own pk then you are in for big trouble uh, as i have seen by people that have precognitive dreams namely that they are going to reproach themselves they they say oh i didn't succeed to prevent it it's their, uh, they, they, they become depressed because they didn't, uh, uh, they didn't, uh, succeed in preventing the, the, the disaster. Is that answering your question? Yes, it does. It puts you in a very uncomfortable spot because I do have a lot of crash dreams. And an example would be, I would see the airline. It was American Airlines and I would know it was a lot of people and I know there was a fire. But I don't know the location, and I don't know the flight number. I don't know when it happens, although it's usually on the third day after the dream. Yeah, generally, so there's not enough to call the airport with. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Now, and then I, people I are afraid they're going to be arrested by the TSA and the port authority or whoever else is running the airport. <laughs> exactly, this is a, a risky business. Uh, uh, if you are not arrested uh, for uh, uh, a terrorist act, then you might be arrested because you are crazy. Right. Uh, right. So, uh, so you uh, you be uh, cautious in, uh, if you have precognitive dreams. And generally, you are right. The the number of details in these dreams uh, are generally not enough uh, to prevent it, uh, which is also interesting because there might be a lot of details, but not the, the right details. Not the details that would allow you to intervene. And you can see that you may be talking to the It's frustrating. I have one more quick question. Um, yeah, well, let me, let me first uh, treat your frustration. <laughs> okay. <laughs> because uh, the frustration uh, is, you shouldn't be frustrated. Uh, Sai is not, Sai is, is a phenomenon, right? It is not there to help people or to prevent disasters. It's just there. 
So that's my that's my model, right? It's not. Uh, I mean, there are other people that think that sci must be used to prevent disasters and so on. But uh, I think that's nonsense. nonsense. Anyway, you shouldn't uh, be uh, worried at all. But you know, we're all wondering why me. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. So, are there more questions? I hope so. I had one. <clears throat> I was also fascinated by the comment that the mind might not be the brain. Are there any hypotheses about what it might be? <laughs> uh, well, I'm not. I'm not an. Uh, I'm. I'm not uh, a supporter of that notion. <clears throat> ah, I think. Okay. Oh, I said, uh, if you look at the brain as the as the seat of where everything happens, then it is impossible to filter all that information from the future and the past and everywhere on the world to get to your, you know, you get you get a dream that your <clears throat> that a family member has a motor accident somewhere in Australia uh, in uh, you don't know when, but it could be of in two weeks. And uh, but uh, it's generally uh, claimed by uh, proponents that uh, we we are able to filter all that information so that we are left with the personal relevant information. Now that doesn't fit with my experiences, and I, I doubt whether it does fit uh, with the general experiences of precognitive dreaming, which are generally not much, has not much to do with yourself. Uh, and uh, so why is it filtered? Why is that precognitive dream allowed to enter your brain? Now, the only way uh, to uh, allow for this incredible filtering capacity that is supposed to happen is to say, no, it's not the brain that is filtering, it's the mind. All right? Well, that's an escape, but nobody knows what the mind is, so it's an escape. But there are people that say, yes, yes, we, we know, basically, we know everything, we are connected to everybody, we are connected to the past, present, and future, to each other, to whatever, and we have to filter it. And we, we filter out the things that are relevant to us. That's very interesting. I, I like the concept of perhaps we're all in a super string field where there is no past, present, and future. And sometimes we tap into that, but you know, how do we tap into that? And sometimes we don't, or some people do, and some people don't. So I, I tried to build a super what... string field on this sim and, and, and come up with a concept of what it feels like. And I came up with an empty room with lights that blurred the edges of your avatar, and that's all I could come up with. <laughs> that in <and> a song. <laughs> yeah, well, if, if you have had, I've had one uh, mystical experience in my life, uh, not after meditation, but after uh, LSD. Uh, and that uh, is unmistakably. I mean, uh, it's there's no way that it could have been different from the reports that you uh, have. Uh, read from the great mystics, and I must say that uh, is an experience which where time and space are, seem to be irrelevant. It's just a big light, and um, and it's in some way also very emotional because uh, although I didn't know that, but my sitter, the the, the person that uh, was was with me. Uh, describe my, my that I was crying like hell. I mean, I produced a lot of water, uh, uh, but I wasn't depressed actually. When I came out of that uh, experience, I thought, well, I want to do this again, <laughs> but I never did it. Again. <laughs> but maybe that's, that's funny. also that's yeah. But it's a it's a very nice experience, and 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 and, and people can be influenced by that throughout their whole life, and and. Indeed, infer that what they experience is something like a, a timeless, spaceless reality, uh, which is, I'm not that much in, inclined to do that at this moment. I'm, I'm still, uh, I'm still struggling actually with that experience. In the, if you see this kind of uh, singular experiences uh, have to be, cannot be uh, uh, put under the carpet. Of course, that's why I'm talking about it. And but it has to be uh, unified within with the experimental tradition, and that's a difficult issue. 
I agree. That's the problem. It, once it happens, it, it stays with you the rest of your, your life. But how do you explain it? How do you prove it? How do you replicate yeah. it? I mean, it's just, it's difficult. Since so, we so, have so, no, uh, uh, Nancy, since we have no truth in experimental science, we have no proof either. We just have uh, models. Uh, but we have to incorporate these data, this spontaneous data, in our models. And one of the persons, by the way, that I didn't talk about much, or I, not at all actually, uh, who has, is in a perfect position to do that, is a German researcher, Dr. Walter von Dukadu. He has a counseling service, but he is also uh, he has also been involved and is still involved in a lot of experimental sci work. His uh, position and of almost all German researchers now is indeed the, the, the position that psi cannot be a signal, is not a signal. That's, and therefore, uh, and, and once you try to use it as a signal, that's his position, then it evaporates of the, the moment you use it. <coughs> so that would suggest that we can never be able to make a replicable experiments. However, he has come up with an interesting uh, uh, proposal uh, to measure not directly psi, but correlations of psi with many variables. Okay, so you, you get a lot of correlations, and some are, are strong, and some are weak, and so on and so forth. And <clears throat> now, if you find a correlation between the personality trait of extraversion and side performance, then it makes sense to uh, to uh, use that to select subjects with a high extraversion, okay, to get better research. And uh, and he says that is impossible <coughs> because then it basically you are trying uh, treating this correlation as a kind of a signal. And when you do that, the correlation disappears or it reverses. And that's what's often observed in experimental parapsychology. You can even wonder why are people uh, continuing this research, because very often it's very disappointing. So uh, what he came up with, that if you measure all these correlation coefficients, so there will be, let's say, something like 60 correlation coefficients of the psi with a uh, personality directed variable of something else that you can measure, whatever the temperature, etc., etc. Et you find uh, significant correlations that won't replicate the next time. But he says, his claim is, there is too much correlation in the correlation matrix, more than you can expect best chance. Okay? And that boils down to there is more connectedness in the world than you can expect best chance. Right? Correlations are kind of a, a measure for connecting, connectedness. So that's his claim. And how can we use that? Well, you're by not looking at one cell or one relation, but, but to all 60. And if his claim is that you can get replicability if you use a correlation matrix as dependent variable rather than only the psi measure. So there is hope. There is hope, and the hope is big. Because I can tell you there are bio grants uh, now uh, given uh, at least uh, to one such a replication. And uh, there is a, in preparation a, a consortium that will uh, consist of about 10 to 20 academ academic labs that will replicate this experiment in one parallel, just simultaneously. Because there is also some some suspicion and that is purely a suspicion that it's the sequential aspect of experiment after experiment after experiment which brings about the decline well if you do it simultaneously you can even you cannot even define a decline so parallel replications that seems to be a, a promising avenue in experimental work and also if that fails, by the way, if that fails and we are unable to continue our experimental approach for the moment uh, until maybe science has 
gotten his act, their act together. Uh, then we should focus, and this is very strange from a pure experimentalist that I am, that I am. we should focus on spont spontaneous events. And not just report these events and report uh, how improbable they were and, and, and that there are many people who observe them, etc., etc. Not only that, but trying to find factors, variables in these events that you can score across events and, and find patterns in your data. That's, that's the, 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 let's say, if experimental biopsychology goes down the drain, we have to focus on spontaneous material. Um, the first uh, 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 question can be answered by um, basically a personality characteristic, I think. I think uh, a good scientist is curious. And uh, I must say, I'm afraid that not all scientists are really curious. There's a lot of science going on which is basically confirming uh, status quo or finding out things that you would uh, that you don't need any experiment to find out and there are a few uh, people that are sensation seeking curious and scientists and if they come across the data that will trigger their curiosity because the data uh, are actually i can tell you that uh, before we did the analysis of questional research practices in the meta-analytic data of gun cells, I was totally, con no, not totally, but I was much more convinced that there, that there is a real phenomenon that we are studying. Now it's 50-50. That's the first one. So it's a personality characteristics of, of uh, you know, people that are interested in, 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 in sensational, in more or less sensational news and so on. The second uh, question is uh, one that I have to repeat my answers. Uh, there is no proof uh, because we are doing experimental science. We make uh, certain uh, explanations and uh, models less and others more probable. And that can, can go to very, you can go, go to uh, uh, some uh, uh, observation that uh, uh, that the probability that there is really a real sigh here going on is uh, uh, or the, that, that uh, the other way around the, the, the probability that sigh is not going on is smaller than and then you get a number but it's not a proof in the sense of mathematics it's making uh, alternative explanations less and less probable so I'm sorry we cannot we cannot prove and uh, this is, this is basically uh, the error of James Randi. The, uh, James Randi challenges people to come up the stage and uh, do their whatever, uh, clairvoyant or telepathy tricks. And then, uh, he's prepared and, and they have to do that in, let's say, 15 or 20 minutes. That is, that's ridiculous. We are working years, years, years after we, years and we get very small progress. If any, so that's ridiculous. So I propose. Uh, somebody said. Uh, somebody said, uh, told me, uh, why are you not uh, presenting your uh, experiments as proof for the James Randi proof, so to speak? And I'm. I'm. I said, well, I, I don't want this this guy in my lab. It's a nuisance. But uh, I can propose something, and so I propose the following. And to my astonishment, he agreed. And I proposed that I would do a standard uh, presentiment experiment. Okay? In presentiment experiment, you measure the dependent variable, your physiology, your ha heart rate, your skin conductance, whatever, before the, 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 the picture or uh, stimulus is shown. And which picture is shown is a random decision. 
Now, in order to give uh, Randy full control uh, over the experiment without have, having him in the lab, I uh, proposed that we would send the physiological data over internet. And once he had the data in, he could uh, initiate, uh, send back the, the number that represents the, the stimulus, right? So he has the data in even before the stimulus is known. And therefore there can, that, that there can be no trickery at all, except by breaking into his computer or something like that. In the next phase, I realized that he could, of course, still be fraudulently uh, uh, choosing pictures that didn't fit the physiology. So there was a third person involved in between us. Then he said, okay, I, I, it's good. And then I, I, and, uh, he would propose it to his uh, scientific committee. And I proposed the money issue to handle uh, differently than he uh, does. He, he promises a million dollars. But uh, I said, well, no, suppose I do this experiment and run it for a year. And I get a, an overall p-value of 1 over 1,000. Uh, so the p, the probability that this is not psi is 1 in 1,000. Then I get $1,000. And if it is 1 in 10,000, I get $10,000. Is it 1 in a million? I get a million. And above that, you don't have the money. And probably it, he has no money at all, actually. But anyway, he went to the scientific committee, and I never heard uh, from my proposal again. So it was shut down. Uh, so that's about proof. Uh, well, there will always be curious people and there will always be spontaneous uh, uh, reports and, and, and cases. And so uh, the interest in Psy will stay, but it might shift a little bit. And you see that already uh, to the question, how can people so stupid that they believe in this? <laughs> Uh, so there will be psi research and uh, anomaly uh, anomaly research. There are a few skeptics that they they uh, have an anomaly laboratory, but that the major purpose to find out why people are so stupid to believe in this. So it will be, but it could be that uh, I'm not sure. I, 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 as I said, fifty fifty. That's my uh, current position, and I think it will be. The other thing is, I think it will be fast. I think it will not take many years anymore before the, this develops into a kind of a, a solution. I have another loaded question. Maybe light is the key. If one sees images on their closed eyelids morphing from light reflection through your eyelids, I think they're called phosphines or something like that. But they morph, they morph into images that predict the future. Um, on a related question, if the Hubble Space Telescope sees 13 billion light years into the past on a distant star from Earth, how do we find what that star is like now in the present? Actually, the only way to find out that is using, uh, using parapsychology. Uh, because, uh, if, uh, these um, uh, within the, the framework of the uh, the more um, spiritual proponents that, that they think everything is non-locally connected, and that word non-local means here that it, it goes immediate. <coughs> there is no restriction <coughs> with the speed of light. So that's that's the only way that I, because we apparently. Uh, so far, our uh, 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 models of relativity do not allow speeds above the speed of light. So it will always be delayed. It's funny sometimes to sit back and watch, although I, I'm 100% supportive of the space program, I'm thinking sometimes you're doing it all wrong, guys. Do it with your mind. <laughs> <laughs> At least cheaper. <laughs> right. <laughs> less, probably less precise. Well, let's go. <laughs>
well, and, and it leave it to the. I know that there is, uh, there are people that, uh, and I think even there was it uh, one. Uh, what's his name? Who uh, in the sixties? Ingo Swan. Do you do you remember that one? Ingo Swan was a uh, an artist, I think, and a painter. Interesting, probably. interesting. And he uh, had description of the back of the moon, and that was far before the time that we went around the moon. So, yes, I've seen uh, UFOs in medieval paintings. Uh, what has that to do with it? <laughs> I've seen UFOs in medieval paintings, paintings done 500 oh. years ago. Yeah, of course you see them, because UFOs are an unidentified flying object, so even a, 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 a strange species of birds would, would be an unidentified flying object. <laughs> uh, so, no, I'm not, I'm not, uh, I, I have seen these, uh, these things, and it, it they are true, and basically, you will. Interestingly, this explains uh, why people are attracted to do this. People that are attracted to do this are also reading uh, these stories about uh, UFOs that were here before us, and so on. It, all these, all these things do, in some way, trigger our curiosity. Uh, that keeps us uh, rolling. Well, that's the motto for today and for your willingness to come here and speak with us. And that's keep rolling. <laughs> <laughs> I, I'm, I'm, I'm going to sleep because last night was a horrible night, but um, uh, I'll, I'll, I'll keep it up. Yeah, we're okay. so grateful you came today. We don't want to keep you any longer. Does anybody have anything else they wanted to ask before uh, Dick goes? They can always uh, mail me. Just uh, in uh, in the first life, and uh, and I'll I'll always uh, respond. So that's, that's terrific. That's Thank you so much. Hi there, I'm Lisa Coley. I'm president of Parapsychology Foundation. So welcome to our YouTube channel. We have lots to look at, so please check out our videos. Don't forget to subscribe. Thank you.